Uh, any other kind of general questions? All right. So today we're going to talk about control statements. Um, I was going to skip this, um, but I realized that we need it to talk about the other things we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about these a little bit. Um, but I get the impression that maybe some people are stressed, so I thought you needed a kitten. Uh, so there you go. Everybody gets a cute kitten. And now we're going to do a little demo. Uh, we do have a lot of stuff to get through today, so I'm sorry if I'm moving a little fast, but please, please ask questions. Um, all right, so, uh, oh, actually, well, I thought I fixed that slide. Um, uh, as I've mentioned in a bunch of times before, right, um, we kind of interchange a bunch of statements a lot. So uh, I'll say sometimes control statement or conditional statement. Um, I would actually say conditional statement is the more common term, but they mean the same thing. Okay, so basically, if you think of it from a control perspective, it's the path through your program, right? Um, and you think about conditional, it's, um, you know, basically cause and effect type statements. So control statement, generally speaking, is a little broader, um, and conditional statement is kind of a subset, but they're often used interchangeably. So if you see that, that's why. Um, all right, so hopefully, oops, I didn't realize I cut this off. All right, so um, we're going to play a game, uh, in, uh, but not really. We're just going to talk about playing a game. Um, so basically, we each roll a die, all right? And um, if I have a bigger number, then I win a dollar. If you uh, have a higher number, then you win the dollar. Um, and if we're equal, then nobody wins, okay? It's just a draw. Uh, so what we wanna do now is make a function to play that game. Uh, so, oh boy. So does anybody know how we might do that? Has anybody read ahead in the book or? We can do the simplest version first. Any ideas? Like I said, we have a lot to cover. Uh, get through today. So if you have an answer, jump on it. All right, so this is where we introduce um, the if statement. Uh, and like a lot of things in programming, it's kind of exactly what it sounds like. So if uh, my role is greater than um, your role, then what happens? We're just going to return one because what we're going to do is uh, we're going to share like the return value is going to be like how many dollars are awarded right uh, to me specifically. Uh, one thing I just want to point out, um, this is one of the things that annoys me about Python. So uh, many programming languages have uh, line ending statements, okay, or line ending characters, uh, which is commonly semicolon. If you've ever taken programming in many languages, it's commonly semicolon. Python, uh, to make it simpler, uh, doesn't use line endings. Okay, instead it relies on spacing to make sure that it can figure out what the code is doing. Except sometimes. And so this anything where there's an except sometimes that really gets on my nerves. Uh, this is why I don't like English very much. For example. Uh, so you notice the colon on the def statement, right? We have a colon on the if statement as well. So any of these conditional statements, um, uh, they have a colon to indicate that there's kind of more coming. Okay. So just don't forget it because I know I do all the time. Yeah. So I'm going to try very hard to have partial credit, um, but I do actually warn you in the beginning of the midterm, I just wrote it, wrote like the warning like an hour ago saying, be careful of that because, um, you know, it really can ruin the entire thing, right? So the colon, for example, here will just result in an ugly error, no to not, you know, very easy to fix, right? Um, but if you do something like forget a paren or forget an angle bracket or a square bracket, uh, that can often result in a different outcome for the code. So I would say that if you get a different outcome from the code versus an error, that is definitely going to be completely wrong. Okay. But if you, uh, you know, if it's something that's likely to be caught by a syntax checker, um, then that's where you'd probably get some partial credit. So be very careful of it. It is important. And the reason it's important is because when you're doing it, um, 
you know, you, you've got to get it right. Otherwise, you'll get outcomes that you don't expect. Uh, this is the other reason why, you know, testing, 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 testing. Okay. Whenever you build any kind of uh, code at all, I strongly recommend that you run a few tests and make sure the outcome is what you expect. Okay. So, uh, in this case, we're just going to return a one um, and we're going to have, whoop, look at that. I forgot my colon. No, I didn't. Oh, I just typed up. Okay. So, uh, so I defined my, uh, my method, right? And so, um, and so one round here is like one round of our game. Um, obviously, one round of this game is probably not very interesting. But then, as I kind of just said, we run some tests, okay? So we check, like generally speaking, when you want to run a couple of tests to make sure things are working, do what, I, what are technically referred to as like bounding conditions, okay? So in other words, kind of test all the different scenarios, okay? So the first thing we test is where I'm winning, right? Um, and so that gives me a dollar, okay? Then I test where you're winning um, and Notice we get no result. Does anybody know why we don't get a result at all? Yeah. So, so you're mostly correct. So um, because we have no other case, right? Which in most programming uh, is referred to as else, right? If this or else, right? Um, however, uh, the kind of, more general answer is that there you can sometimes leave this method without a return statement, right? So, and when we do that, right, we just return none. There's no there's no actual return, um, in and that's sometimes the right answer, okay. But most of the time, you want to be careful. Uh, like I actually prefer to have my code written such that that it always has a way out that includes a return, even if the return is something like an error or something invalid or something like that. I don't like writing code that looks like that because there's kind of a condition where I don't know what happened, right? So we're gonna write this a little bit better, um, but we're taking the same parameters and then we kind of have the same beginning code. Give me I'm typing correctly. Um, oops. And then, we do the colon and we do return one. And I could have just uh, copied and pasted that. All right, so now we're gonna do two things at once. Um, so like I said, we can have an if, and then we can say, let's look at else. Actually, uh, I should introduce this better. Um, but so if we have an if, then we can have an else. But sometimes we don't wanna have just a plain old else. We wanna do an else if, right? because there's three different conditions we want to check for. So we don't want to just say, it's not two conditions, right? It's not if and else, which would look like uh, this. So instead we use else if, except in, uh, because programmers, um, it's shortened to elif, okay? So, but it does kind of exactly the same thing. However, if I just left it alone like that, it will throw an error because there's no condition for the if part of the else. Does that make sense? Okay. So what I want to do here is um, if my, right, so if your role is higher than my role, then what do I want to return? Let me remember. Negative one, right? All right, and then we're gonna have one more condition, but this is where I get into some like debate where your role, and now here's another new thing that we're gonna introduce quickly, which is equals my role. And then we're gonna return, oops, and I forgot my colon. All right, so what I want to point out, in case it's not suddenly obvious, you see the double equal sign? So that's not an assignment, okay? So when we have a name and a value, right, we assign that using equals. It becomes the thing, right? Whereas double equals means, are these the same? Okay, so it's a test. So it's kind of like the angle bracket with the less than and greater than, okay? 
except that this is how you say, is this equal to the other thing? Everybody got it? All right. So now we should get a better result. Um, the only thing is, if you kind of, well, I'll do that in a second. All right, so we should get a better result now. So now we have the condition where one in one, so we get tied, so therefore there's no outcome. Um, and then we have uh, I win, so I get a dollar, and I, now, yeah, and so here's, here's another edge case, right, that's not being accounted for. Um, so we have a negative one, so, wait, did I type up, never mind. I thought it wasn't handling negatives, but it is. So that's why I often, right? Mm -hmm. They're both in the same direction. No, but I flipped, I flipped the variables. So it's seven. That should be negative one, shouldn't it? Anybody see what I did wrong? I'm, I'm sure I have a typo, but I can't see it. Yeah. 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 Any ideas? I might just call it a day and move on because I didn't visit them stress we're not gonna have enough time so let's see if we do three that also doesn't work so there's definitely a bug oh duh. yeah i told you i'm not you know some days all right there we go that's what i want um i think i just yeah mix it up so the thing is as i said before what I don't love about this is that it only has a return if you do things correctly. So what I might do instead, because I like to know what happened, is in all cases return, you know, uh, let's say negative 1,000 or 10,000. Um, so now if any of the conditions aren't satisfied, I'll get a negative 10,000 which clearly indicates that there's something weird going on. I could also raise an error and all that stuff, but we won't get into that today. Um, but the point being is then now that something in here will happen no matter what, okay? Whether I have, because you know, it's really common to get the arrows backwards or I actually almost always will do this the other way um, where so that I can see, I have one arrow going this way, one arrow going the other way, and then one that's equal. Um, so. All right, so we'll just execute that. And then just, yeah, okay. All right, so does everybody understand the basics of kind of an if statement? It's pretty straightforward. Like I said, it, it sounds very English-like to me, right? You know, if, and then check this condition, um, then do something, okay, um, and then, otherwise do something else or you can kind of combine that right so um i don't know if you can actually do this in python but we could do a much uglier version of this by let's see if i have it. so i could say else and then in this statement do another if right and then as a type right so i can do it with just the else statements right so this is equivalent to that up there right um just like this is equivalent to that up there so i can write it out it's just that it's hard to read it's harder to follow and you very quickly end up way over here, right? So that's why we usually combine it. Um, but that's a perfectly valid way to write it as well. It's just generally considered less uh, pretty. All right. So the first thing we're going to do, we talked about this. Uh, we've talked about some randomness before, um, but I'm not sure we talked about a function to pull to do randomness uh, for us. So conveniently. 
np, which if you recall is numpy, um, has a function called random, and then it can actually do a choice on an array. So what do you think that's going to give us? Any idea? Yeah, one of them, right? So cool, oh, different, oh, same, different, right? So it's just going to randomly choose. That randomness is, is independent every time, right? So as a result, it may be the same again, or it may be a different one. And theoretically, there's no way to know because it's random. Um, so what if I want to do a bunch of them at a time? Well, so then we can use the other or another parameter um, where we take the same array and then we can give it a count. All right. And so what we get back is an array of random results. Um, and so if you watch it, right, it should change each time I run it, um, you know, because it's pretty unlikely to be exactly the same every time. So I can just run it with seven or I can run it with a whole bunch. Um, but then what's handy is, if you recall, right, we can do operations on the whole array at once. So what if we wanted to find out if, like, if we, what if we want to find out how many times wake up appears in the resultant array? Let me have a guess about how you might do that. I gave you a big part of the hint. All right, so obviously we're going to put wake up in here, what do you think we put in between? We want to know if they're equal, right? So what do we use? Double equal, yeah. So, um, so that kind of tells us which like kind of positions are are uh, in this case, right? I don't actually know what the result was, right? Because I didn't print it. It's not the same as this one necessarily. It could be. Um, so it's just going to tell us, okay, we have uh, looks like four wake ups in this uh, result set um, because we compared each one and then got true or false depending on whether or not it found it or not. Uh, so that's convenient, except what is usually more convenient is that, and this is recalling from a while back, we can actually count those up by using sum, okay? Um, and I will say, right, that that just magically ended up with the same number, okay? Because of randomness. So if I do it again, maybe I'll get a different number. I guess not. Yeah, I'm not doing anything wrong. Yeah, there we go. I was like, how is it consistently getting the same result? Um, so, you know, it should just come out. It could be one, it could be seven. You know, it doesn't, you never know because it's random. Um, and the reason I'm bringing that up is because we're going to use that later because what we want sometimes, right, is we want to just pull a choice out of there with randomness, right? We want to know, um, you know, we want to get, uh, you know, an element, but we don't, we in, like almost intentionally don't want to know which one we're going to get. And we'll talk about that more in a bit. Um, all right, and then to kind of set up, let's see, the next part. All right, so in uh, this past week, let's just say, or let's say for next week, um, using randomness, we get to decide whether we're going to sleep in or wake up early. Um, so I'm sure there's a lot of people who would honor that. Um, and then we can, but then we can kind of say, okay, how many days are we going to uh, wake up early? And then how many days are we going to sleep in? But now I'm using a variable, right? So as a result, it's the same 
set each time. And if I typed it correctly. Um, what else we have? Oh. All right. So, you know, so it counts to three, it counts to four. So now we know that um, how many are in each one. Um, and then, you know, we can get into things that are slightly more interesting. Um, so, for example, on a die, we know there are how many, how many sides on a die, like the kind you roll? Six. And the thing is, how many dots are in each one? Like, is there any that have zero? Right. So we're going to do MP range here for one to seven. Right. So it's going to be one, you know, two, three, four, five, six, uh, just because we want it to look like a die rather than, um, you know, just zero to five, I guess. So, all right. And then so we can roll a die by just doing random choice and we get a, a die roll. Right. So this is a great way uh, I have used many a time to try to pick a restaurant you know, with some other people is roll a die because that way uh, you can see what you actually favor. Um, and we should get a different result most of the time uh, and then, you know, kind of move on. But so what we want to do there is then um, now we're, we're kind of setting up that same game, right? So, but we want to do it in this different way. So we're going to um, set up one round and so we need to figure out what my role is, right? So does anybody have any idea how we get to my role? Right, because what we were doing before is we were just hard coding numbers, right? And we were calling it, you know, and then saying, you know, was it right or wrong? Or uh, sorry, did I win or did I lose or did I tie? So how can I, um, how can I get my role here? If I want a random die roll. Die faces, then what? Or like what around it or whatever. Right, MP random choice. At the end of this, I might learn to type. Okay, so now my role has got, um, you know, a value that is randomly pulled from the set of seven sides. Um, and then I can do exactly the same thing, except for your role. Right. And now what should I do to see who won? Yeah, it's called the function, the, the outcomes function, um, which is called one round, which is probably not the best name in this case. Um, it might better be called like, you know, outcome or winner. All right, and now, so we have a function that now can simulate one game, right? And so there we go. Um, I lost the first time. I lost the second time, or tied rather. I, now I actually lost. And I actually lost again. I'm not very good at this. All right, and then I finally won. Um, so, you know, we're gonna kind of move on from there. All right, so we're still trying to set up that game. Okay, so um, I know I'm kind of going off to kind of explain individual pieces, but we're still trying to set up the game of you know, let's do these these die rolls and figure out who wins more often, you know, or whatever. Um, so we need to move into another control statement, which is called a for statement or commonly also a for loop, okay? And so what a for statement does or a for loop does uh, is for X number of times do something, okay? So again, it's very much like the English, um, and we syntactically, we do it kind of the same way as we do uh, the, the if statement or a def statement. Um, so we can say, 
but it's a, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. So what we do is we do four and then we do, okay, what's the holder? Okay, we just give it a name for the holder. And then we say in, which means pick out of this thing I'm giving you. And then we have an array of cat, dog, and rat. Okay, so for each time I go through the loop, it's going to put cat in pet. Okay, then it's going to put dog in pet. Then it's going to put rabbit in pet. Okay, and then when it runs out, it's going to stop. Does that make sense? Right. And so the in statement's really nice because it will uh, it'll stop when it's run out of things. Okay. But again, I th I think it's pretty like Englishy, right? Where it's like okay for each of the elements in this set of elements. Okay, so theoretically, this will run three times and print I love my cat, dog, rabbit. Right? And it doesn't error because it knows when to end because there's only, it, it says, oh, I'm just going to pull them out while I find them. And then once I run out, I stop. All right. And we're going to talk a lot more about uh, kind of conditionals and loops and that kind of stuff uh, after the midterm. Um, so we're just trying to get a little bit of coverage here to introduce you to the ideas. Um, so once we have that for loop, now you know we can kind of do more sophisticated things. So does anybody have? Oh, sorry. So so that was the for loop we printed them all, um, and then I don't think we've talked about this syntax yet. Does anybody have an idea what will print in that first one? Yeah. Yes, um, I had to look. Uh, so this is just a way of saying, give me this element by hand from each of the, from the array, okay? And the reason this is handy, okay, is that this is actually exactly how the for loop works. Okay, so the for loop kind of just pulls that item thing and then pulls each, you know, and adds a digit and keeps adding up until, until it runs out, essentially. Um, so from an implementation perspective, I don't know if they're checking the length first and then going up until that, or if they're just waiting to get an error and then they stop. But either way, it's just a counter, right, that they can pass the item, and that's how they get the for loop to work. And so... I'm in the right place, which I am not. We get exactly the same result, except um, you know, from a slightly different perspective. Um, obviously, if we had seven items, we wouldn't get them all in the second example, right? We would get them all in the first example. So that's why I hope for loops are handy. You don't have to know a whole lot about the thing that uh, you know is containing your list. Um, you can just kind of pass it uh, to the for loop and then you'll figure it out using the in statement. Not the only way to run a for loop, but it is probably the most common. So, okay, going back to our game, how, if we, if we look here, right, how would we get five game outcomes easily? Using a for statement or a for loop. Any ideas? Well, how do we get how do we get from kind of zero to four in an array? We I don't have we used it today. I don't know if we've used it today, but we've definitely used it a whole bunch in the past. So how do we get an array of digits from zero to four. Yeah. A range, right? So if we say np dot range and then five, right? Because we want the top exclusive. Um, but now we can say four and then in, right? But we need some place to hold it, right? Because uh, we need that digit every time, just like we did with the pets. Okay. So 
there's two schools of thought here. Um, some people use an arbitrary name that has nothing to do with anything. Um, and some people prefer to use, um, you know, something that has meaning. In this case, I'm going to show you one where it's arbitrary uh, because just so you see the example, because we used in the for loop, we used one that had meaning, right? We used the word pet, right? Um, and actually very commonly up here, you would actually call this array, you would call it pets, right? And then you would have each individual item called pet uh, so that it's a little clearer what's going on. So in this case, we're gonna use I, and I is one of the most common ones that's kind of a throwaway uh, character because all we're going to do is for this um, step, right? We're just going to loop across it. We don't really care what that I is. It has not a lot of influence, right? Because inside the um, outcomes uh, function, it's it's all randomness, right? The, the I is not even an input. So we're just going to throw it away. So I makes a lot of sense. If you need multiple, intuitively enough, it usually goes I, J, K, etc. Usually you skip L, so it looks like one. Um, I've never understood why we started with I, but it's like long standing practice because it's actually kind of hard to read. It looks like other characters. Uh, so it's a little weird. I think it stands for item. You think so? You think it's where it comes from? Item? Huh. Interesting. Uh, another common one you'll see is foo um, or bar, uh, which both come from a really old military term that I'm not going to mention, but has gotten so corrupted now that it's not even spelled the same. Um, which I think is kind of amusing. So, so now we have our fancy, fancy for loop. And so we're gonna say, okay, we want all the game outcomes in this box, right? In this array. So now we're gonna introduce another kind of newish function, which is, if you notice, we already had, oh, that's what we did this one. Uh, we already have an array here, right? So what we did was we made an empty array and we stuck it in game outcomes, okay? So now we're going to add to that array. Does anybody have a guess what that uh, method might be called if we're going to add something? And it's not quite as obvious as I'm making it sound, but it's pretty close. Append. append. Um, all right. Does anybody know what the word append means? Sorry, add it to the end. Um, so this is a common English word. Um, you'll often see in programming land as well, much less commonly in English, also prepend, which means put it at the beginning, okay? And upend means put it at the end. Um, if you took Latin, I think that would give you some hints as to why it's called upend. Um, so there, the NP uh, uh, library has a method called append. And so we're going to add some, we're going to add to the game outcomes, if I can type it correctly. And then two things. One, if you notice, we're not directly appending it, right? We're taking our existing array, we're appending what we're going to put on the right here after the comma, and then we're going to assign it to this one because otherwise we'd just be throwing away. So by default, it does not actually modify game outcomes. It only is modifying it because we're gonna assign it. All right, so what do I put in this on the right side of the comma? Does anybody remember? Let's see, there's a hint. Exactly. So simulate one round. And as I said before, like nowhere in here is the I used, right? So that's why we just throw it away. We don't care what it is. Um, and then we can execute it. And then we get a quasi ugly result. Oh, I forgot. Um, <laughs> yeah, so so I actually did something that's perfectly valid um, that is way further advanced in Python than we are right now, which is I actually attached 
the method itself into the array because I forgot to put it in prints. So that looks a lot better. Um, I'm still on a pretty serious looping streak though. So loss, win, loss, lo uh, win, loss. All right, but I have five games now that I've played. Um, now, let me see if there was something else I was gonna talk about. Um, so that was five instances of this game. What could we do to make it a whole bunch more? Let's say like 10,000 of them. So it's exactly the same uh, like code block. What can I do to make it 10,000 of them? Yeah. Exactly. Personally, I think it almost looks like we have another method here, right? Um, so we get a whole bunch uh, as signified by this ellipsis here that it's not going to print it all out for us. Um, so what we can do is we can find out how many actually landed in there. Does anybody remember how to do that? If we want to just know how many items are in the array game outcomes. Oh, I already have it. Look at that. So then we get 10,000, right? So that ellipsis, okay, ellipsis means, you know, in like the both English and programming, it means missing stuff here, okay? Um, and so the only way to find out what the missing stuff is, unless you get real explicit about trying to print it out, which is no fun at all, um, is to do something like length, right? To find out how long it is, uh, then we can find out how many there are. All right, so then we can get cooler about it we can actually uh essentially make a table out of that right if we want to look at the data in a you know slightly nicer fashion all right so now we have our ten thousand uh outcome all added into a table in the column with a column of my winnings here because it was just an array so we can we can mess with it um now, what might be interesting to do to see how I'm actually doing, right? On the, excuse me, on the five, I wasn't doing very well, um, but I have no idea how I'm doing on the 10,000. So how could I find out a nice, you know, an easy way to find out what, how I'm doing? I could add them all up. Um, that would be one way. Uh, and that would tell me the totals, right? So. Let's see. Let's see. Do I want to? Yeah, let me continue on. So that would be one way. But in light of all the stuff we've been looking at recently, what would be a nice way to visualize this? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so we could group it. Um, I get the casing right. Right, so I can group it. And now I know that um, all y'all won 4,190 times. We tied 1,608 times. And I won 4,202 times. So I'm actually winning, right? Um, by like a little bit. <clears throat> 12, I think. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, what's another thing we could do that would make it even easier to tell what's going on? Graph. What kind of graph? Uh, just categorical. Oh, no, I forgot that. It only has one column. Just use that one. 
assume you know what I mean. All right, and so now I get a pretty picture that shows um, that I'm winning by a hair, right? All right. I thought. Yeah, okay. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this stuff. Um, all right, so is that making sense? Like, so, you know, if we want to test, do a test, we can use an if statement. If we want to do a loop, we're going to do something a bunch of different times. We can use a for statement. Um, if we, you know, once we get a result or whatever and we make an array out of it, we can then turn it into a table. So it's all the stuff we've been doing all along. It's just that, you know, all the stuff builds together, right? And so we can, we, even though we have a very limited set of like functions or a very limited set of things we can do, we can keep building on it and it actually turns into things that are get very expressive, right? We can actually make really big things. Um, so we're gonna talk about another simulation. Um, and how are we doing on time today? Not too bad. Um, all right, so let's see if I can. Real thing is I have no idea if we'll get sound, so that may not work. All right, has anybody ever seen the play or read the play Hamlet? All right, does so anybody remember the characters Rosencrantz and Guildenstern? Okay, so if I flip a coin, heads and tails, what happens? Most of the time, you get one or the other, right? Um, and it's pretty random. And if it's a fair, what's often referred to as a fair coin, you will get them in an even distribution, as in you will get exactly the same number of heads and tails if you do it for long enough, right? That doesn't mean that any individual instance will actually result in a 50-50 distribution, right? Um, so there's another play called uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Uh, it's by a guy named Tom Stoppard, who's very a very famous playwright. Uh, and there's a fun movie version of it. And the movie is pretty good, even though like I've actually seen the play as well as read it and seen the movie. Um, and so the movie is actually pretty good. And there's a great scene in the movie that I'm hoping will work. See if it actually will play. Ah, I don't know if we can get sound. Actually, let me start it over because otherwise. So, mind you, uh, what you're about. All right. So the scene goes on like that for a while, and basically, what the whole play is about is what are these two characters doing when they're not in the play? Okay, because they're in a very brief scene, right? But then they kind of just disappear for a long time, and then I think eventually they come back and are dead. Um, but so this whole play is about what they're doing. And what I think is really interesting about this scene, and there's actually another one that's uh, got this, a similar tone um, where they're playing tennis, uh, is that they're in like this nowhere world because they're just literary characters who are just like a piece of the action. And they slowly are figuring it out over the course of the play. Um, so the reason I bring it up is just, Hopefully it'll help you remember a little bit more about probability that, you know, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern will always get heads, but all of you will get heads and tails on a pretty even basis, right? Um, and I love the play, and I think the movie is quite funny, so I recommend it, um, especially if you want to be a nerd. All right, so we're going to make an array which has heads and tails. And, oh my goodness. Um, all right, so before I give it away, uh, I think we asked this already, but somebody else, um, how would I get um, one or the other, head or a tail, by using a command? What would I do? It was answered by the front row over here earlier. I asked the same question. Yeah. Right, 
right? So therefore, so then we're going to get heads. Um, then we can do it a bunch of times, kind of like we were doing before. And we get a bunch of heads and tails. Um, this, I thought this was kind of randomly interesting. I didn't realize heads and tails were the same number of characters until I saw the deep heads up there, which tells us how many characters each of the array fields holds. Um, but I just kind of thought that was randomly interesting. All right, and then we can say, okay, let's figure out how many heads results we have um, by doing the true and false thing. And then again, what do we do if we want to know how many times we got heads? We can also simulate rules and grants building theorem by just making both of them heads. Can I remember? How do I how do I count those easily without counting them per se? Well, sorry, I guess you are counting them. You're adding them up. So what function would I use? Right. Exactly. So does anybody know why some works for this with the true and the false? Yeah. They're, they are exactly. So we're going to also talk a little bit more about Boolean again, kind of after midterm. But kind of for the near term, so a true is uh, kind of can be interpreted as a one, okay, and a false can be interpreted as a zero. So I don't know how many of you have computers that have like an like a, a flippy on off switch. Um, you'll see it on other electronic devices too. But have you ever noticed that uh, it's usually a zero and a one on the on off? So the off is the zero and the one is the on. For the same reason, okay. Um, because if you think about it, computers down at the end of the day, right? They're just zeros and ones. Uh, so, generally speaking, this is actually not true in all programming languages. Um, uh, basic being a, a prime example. Generally speaking, true is one and false is zero. Um, so, so we're gonna uh, put a bunch of outcomes into a flips variable, uh, just so we don't have to keep running that same thing over and over again. Um, and then just for the sake of knowing what's in there, wait, do we care? Oh, no, not really. Um, so, but you get the idea. We, you know, it doesn't really matter what the arbitrary set of things is. We can pull an NP random out of it. We can do it a bunch of times and we can get a bunch of results uh, so we can see uh, how that distribution looks like what you know what what kind of stuff is in there um, and we're going to talk more about uh, why you care about the things that are in there and hopefully in a few minutes. Um, so kind of moving on from there we're actually going to make a little function so which is going to tell us the heads in 100 faucets okay and so. We make a little function that does that, and then we can start building on that because we want to know um, in you know kind of a course across its ten thousand. We want to uh, take those results or, and um, like kind of do a hundred outcomes each time. Kind of see can we actually get to that fifty fifty result, um, and so. As it thinks about it, right? Because now we're starting to do some like material work. It's thinking about it a little bit longer. Um, oh, I went into the wrong boxes. But now we can turn that into a table, right? Uh, and so then we can do cool things like make Instagram. And so, as you can see, we do get a pretty good like standard deviation distribution. Uh, where we can kind of look into this histogram and we can figure out how often the heads is happening, right? So most of the time it's in that 50% range. So the, the world exists as you expect. Um, 
All right. So let's see. I think that's the slides. Yeah. All right. So just to kind of quickly recap, right? So um, control sequence of computation that are performed in a program. If and for, they begin some of those control statements. Um, and you use if so that you can choose different, so you can have different paths, right? Um, and then for is so that you can do the same thing over and over again without having to write it 500 times, right? Or an arbitrary number of times. So um, if and for, I think, will come up uh, next week. Um, so that's why I'm kind of introducing them. Um, more importantly, they actually are in kind of important to some of the other things we're going to talk about here. All right. So has anybody ever heard of the Monty Hall problem? All right. Somebody want to tell us what it is? Yeah. OK, so there's this old TV show called Let's Make a Deal, which I think is actually still on the air, but hosted by somebody else. The host of that game show was a guy named Monty Hall. I don't know if that was his original name or if he took that name for uh, show business. Um, but the way this game worked is you were presented with three doors. So you didn't know what was behind them. And you knew there was a prize behind one of them. Um, and so, and then, you know, something that you didn't want behind two of them. Uh, and so that got turned into, um, I think it was, I wrote down the date. Let me just look here. Um, so I think it was in 1990, basically, this kind of blew up as like an interesting problem because um, you want to know how to win, right? Um, or what's your best chance of winning? So what happens in the game show is you, uh, you know, you're presented with the three doors and then you make a guess, okay? Let's say in this case, I guess door number one, okay? Then Monty would actually open door number three. So one of the other two, okay? Should you keep your original door or should you choose door number two? So anybody who doesn't know the answer to this problem, do you have any guesses? Yeah. Right. So most people look at this and say, because it's like flipping a coin, right? So like flipping a coin, when you flip a coin, you either get heads or tails, right? If I flip a coin again, is there's no effect on the prior time I flipped the coin on the new time I flipped the coin, okay? This is not that, but people feel like it is because you've removed one of the, one of the elements of the equation, and now you're just presented with the door. But in fact, it's actually the same probability as it originally was. So you've actually reduced it. So now this has a much higher chance of winning than this does if I chose door number one. Um, so much, much controversy uh, in, you know, again, the nerd community primarily, but it did leak out into the real world. Um, and so a lot of people talked about this and basically wanted to show kind of the math for. Um, how does it work? So, we talked about it a little bit, uh, and then I'll also show you something randomly. Um, one quick comment too. Uh, whenever we write stuff in these notebooks um, that you know kind of comes out as like text versus like actually a Python expression, that's a, a language called Markdown. And Markdown is a way of doing um, like word processing, looking documents, but in plain text. But the idea of is that when it's processed, it looks nice, but even when it's not, you can tell what they're trying to do. Okay. So in other words, I made a table. So it looks like a table, right? With pipes and bars and stuff like that. Um, normally, if I wanted to do this nicely, well, I would also type correctly. Um, you know, I might line these up a little bit better, et cetera, but you can tell it looks like a table, right? So the reason I'm showing you this though is because we only have, uh, or we have a few different scenarios, right? 
we have the choice where the first choice I make, um, I get goat one, right? And we know there's two goats and there's a car, okay? So in the first time I get goat one. Um, and so what's shown then is goat two. And then the last choice is the car, okay? So because remember, they're always gonna show you not the car, right? Um, so then I choose on the second, you know, whatever, if I'm doing it, another scenario, right? Is that I actually choose go two, um, the reveal is go one, and then the car is the last choice. And then the last one is I actually got the car the first time. Um, and then to, for shorthand reasons, um, you know, I could get go one and go two, or I could get go two and go one, right? That's the other ones. Obviously, those don't actually matter because I've already won the car, so I'm actually not going to go through the rest of the steps. <laughs> Although, as I recall, with the actual game show, if you won the car, um, they would actually give you another set of doors and say, do you want to put your car up against this even better prize? Um, but it's been a long time since I saw the actual show. So we're going to make, oh, yeah, so just by way of display, right? So now it looks actually like a table um, because it's marked down. So. Uh, so I'm going to make a, a doors array with the uh, cars and the goats, um, and then I'm going to make an array of just the goats, right? Um, and then I need a function now that can basically take in like kind of what happened and then give back what uh, kind of what happens next. So if a goat is equal to first goat. What should the result be? Anybody know? I don't know how well I explained that last, but what we're trying to do here. So we're going to return the other goat. And then if we didn't get the, the, the goat as the, like if we didn't get the first goat, then we wanna return, uh, and we got the second goat, we wanna return the first goat, right? So basically all this function does is return the other goat, yeah? So Cool. All right. So now we have a little tester, right? We just make sure that we get a second goat. Um, and then in this case, we asked, we told it we got a chicken. And so therefore we get no goats back, right? Um, because it's not a valid entry. So then we want to go in and make the actual Monty Hall simulation. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm going to drop most of this in here. All right, so the Monty Hall function here, right? The contestant is going to randomly choose a door, right? Um, and then if the contestant chose the first goat, well, then Monty is going to reveal the second goat. And the remaining door is going to be the car. Um, and if the contestant shows the second goat, then Monty is going to show the first goat, and the remaining door will be the car. Um, and then, and mind you, don't forget, right? Just because I chose it, I don't see what's behind it. So, right? Except that you know that it can't be the car. So, kind of do see what's behind it. Um, so, if the contestant chooses the car, then Monty is going to choose one of the goats, um, and then the other goat is Monty's goat. No, right. Oh, no, never mind. I made a mistake. I was misremembering the game. Um, he does not show you it. Uh, yeah. So even if it's the car, you don't see the door. So you show the door and you pick one of the doors and then he reveals one of the other doors. And then you have to choose because now you have two choices. And so, yeah, sorry, I misspoke. So now we have a nice little function that uh, will return 
a kind of an ordering of the of the door. So the contestant in this case chose the second goat. Uh, Monty shows the first goat, and the last door is the top. So if you chose the, and so that's kind of what we're, you know, this is our random like algorithm that will show us the outcomes that could happen, right? And so we should get a different result. Um, and so then we have the games, and what we want to do is actually look at how can we build a whole bunch of them so that, and actually, like I said, I'm just gonna show you this. Okay, so now what I can do is I can, oh, uh, so range is another way of getting uh, basically a set of digits, um, but this could just easily be NT.A range. Um, I think I just typed in the wrong one because I was used to the other one more. Um, so this is just going to do for I in that range, we're going to actually run the game 3,000 times, okay? And we're going to just keep adding a arbitrary or like a random result, right? Where the contestant chooses different things and you get different goats and you get, you know, and then sometimes you win. So we're going to get a table with all those. So now we know that they, the contestant chose, you know, in this case, let's say this one, they chose the first goat, um, then it was revealed the second goat and the remaining one is the top. So now we know which one is in which space for each of those. And so we can, so now what we want to know is, is that guess that you made correct? Right. So, is it better to to change your choice, or is it better to keep your original choice? Right. Because now you're down to two doors. Should you keep the door you chose originally, or should you switch and choose the other one? So, anybody have any idea how we could look at this table to try to figure out that answer? Right. So, in other words, we chose one door here. This one was revealed, and what we want, or potentially, right? If we show, if we stick with our original choice, in this case, we'll get the goat. But if we switch, we'll get the cost. Does that make sense? Uh, I find this a little hard to explain. I don't know why. Um, so what we can do? Well, somebody has an idea. All right, we can do a. Uh, group and what we can do is group the remaining right so in other words that last column so basically that's that switch your choice okay if you choose to switch your choice you will get the car one almost two thousand times right um if you don't switch your choice or i'm sorry so in, but if you do switch your choice you will get the first goat about 500 times and you'll get the second goat about 500 times, right? So this certainly seems to imply that what we want to do is switch our choice, right? Because way more often than not, we get the car. In fact, it should be about like two thirds of the time, right? So, but we can make it even nicer by kind of doing what we did before, which is look at a horizontal bar chart. Um, and so now we can really see that it just kind of really overpowers uh, that you should always change. Um, so yeah, so I, I just think it's kind of interesting, you know, what you want to do is you want to think about the fact that whether you're kind of, are you starting over? Is this a new probability event? Or are you still in the same probability event um, when you're starting over, like the heads and tails scenario? Uh, you know, you're back to square one, kind of. But if you're in the same probability event, um, like the Monty Hall doors, you may not be back to kind of square one. You may not be back to the original probability problem. All right. So. That kind of introduces the term probability. Um, and uh, sorry, 
we're almost out of time. Uh, so we're probably not gonna get to the example around probability, but I can tell you that probability is very important. Um, and so kind of keep it in mind. Uh, and uh, this will be, or this is planning to be on the midterm. So the lowest value is zero, okay? So think about it in terms of an example. Um, the one I was uh, listening to earlier was, what's the probability that if I choose a student in here at random, will they be from Mars? Anybody have a guess? What are the chances are that if I choose a random student, they will be from Mars? Zero percent, right? So if the probability is zero, it's impossible, okay? So obviously we don't actually know, but probably true. Um, so the chance of that event is impossible, so it's a zero. How about let's kind of reverse the question. What is the chance if I, uh, you know, that I pick a student at random and they're from Earth? 100%, right. So if it's certain, then it's 100%. Um, this, I think a lot of people find the compliment being like weird, like why do we talk about this? Um, so the compliment is the like kind of the inverse, right? So you got a, if you have 70% chance of something, the compliment of it is 30%. Okay. Why do we care? Because it is often easier to calculate this number and then complement to get to this number. Okay. Uh, so the example that I'll probably talk about this more after uh, the midterm, um, but the example is like if I flip a coin three times, okay, what are the chances that I will get um, at least one uh, uh, one coin flip that's heads? Okay, well, that's actually very hard to calculate, right? Because there's so many different options for that, right? The head could be in any position. I could get heads for all positions, et cetera, et cetera. So it's actually easier to calculate what are the chances of getting all tails, right? Because that's just one case, right? But it's the only one that doesn't have any heads. Um, and then take the complement of that to get the actual answer you're looking for. Does that make sense? Okay, I want to say it's like 87 and like, and whatever the complement would be 13, um, but don't quote me because I'm not looking at it. Um, but long story short, it's, it's often easier to kind of go look for that weird edge case that does not happen in the probability event you're looking for um, and reverse it to get the, and take the complement and that's the answer you actually want. And that's why people bring it up. I always thought it was very weird. I remember actually in college thinking about uh, why were we talking about the compliment, who cares? And I don't think it was explained very well. So this is kind of important, right? So there's a couple of things to note here, okay? Um, this calculation only works if all the events are equal, okay? So if my coin is weighted, okay? It's not going to flip 50 50 on the uh, you know, heads and tails, okay? Uh, including weighted dice, right? If you ever go to a really sketchy you know, gambling house, you should check your dice. So, but this calculation works the rest of the time. So, the number of outcomes that make it A happen, so whatever it is that you're looking for, and then the total number of outcomes, and that's the probability of A, okay? So, this is how I get to the 50%. The number of outcomes that make A happen is one. And the total number of outcomes is two. And that's one half, which is also 50%. Right? Okay. So, pretty straightforward. Um, you know, the thing that I, you know, you always have to kind of remember is like, you know, the, the, it's almost like the smaller thing goes on the top, right? The fewer thing. And then the total thing goes on the bottom. That's the way at least I remember. So, um, this will not be on the midterm. Um, but just by way of kind of introduction to it. So we'll talk more about like doing this math, right? But it's important, it, this is kind of like why we mentioned this is it goes back to that, like, you know, gut checking tests. You know, if, are you doing something correct, right? And I use this for math, I use this for programming, I use this for pretty much everything, where it's like, I have a gut sense of the kind of output I expect. 
And if it doesn't match that gut check, I probably did something wrong or I need better testing to figure out what's going on. So for example, if you have two things that are two different probability events and you want them both to happen. Okay, so, um, you know, like the prior example of getting uh, one, uh, you know, uh, at least one heads up coin, um, that will, and, but that's three coin tosses, right? So that will be lower than any one of the individual ones. So in other words, that three example, that means that it's going to be well less than 50%. That makes sense. So your gut check 